Okay, so uh, welcome to today's Friday um, lunchtime lecture, which is today delivered by uh, Jamie White of both um, Propolis and of Swell. Today's lecture is on using data to scrutinize decision making. Um, so I'm just going to tell you that um, the lecture today will be live streamed. Um, and for people listening online, if you'd like to ask a question, please do so on Twitter using the hashtag ODI Fridays. Um, we're going to keep questions till the end. Um, and when we do ask questions, I'll just pass you the microphone. And that's for the people who are watching on YouTube. So you're not going to hear the sound amplified, but don't worry about that. So without further ado, let me hand you over to Jamie. OK, thank you. Thanks, Emily. Um, hello. Thank you for coming. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about um, using data to scrutinize decision making. So this is kind of um, how we can, in this sort of post-fact, post-truth, alt-fact world, how can we you know, start, to, start to think about encouraging people to, to kind of use data a little bit better in helping to evidence some of the, some of the decisions that are made, some of the other stuff that's going on. Um, so I'm going to kind of start with a bit about me. I, so this is, this is RDF. Now, I'm, I, kind of, I was going to describe myself in RDF, which is like a way of kind of presenting linked data. So this is, this is about linked data, but then I decided not to because I don't want to be disingenuous because I don't really get RDF. I sort of understand it, but I can't kind of do it particularly well. So I figured, you know, we'd kind of come, this is, this is that. There are people kind of back in Manchester and all over the place um, with Swirl who, who can do this kind of stuff much better than I can. So I'm much more interested in the applications of linked data, the way that we model it, the kind of the rigor that you apply to it, and then how we can use that to really start to, start to kind of support our, you know, the, the kind of the documents that we're producing. So I am, um, I'm currently kind of, I've kind of got my own company, do some stuff with, with Swirl. I'm going to give a bit of background just to kind of say where I've come from. 17 years ago, I started working in Traffic Council, so local authority in the south of Manchester. And for 17 years, I worked for them doing data. So I started off doing you know, kind of a clean, fresh-faced you know, university. Started trying to get my head around um, local authority, how, how, how schools use data. So that's where I started from. And then for, for all those years, I sort of assembled more and more bits of data. So I kind of took different departments on and started to think a bit more creatively about some of the, some of the sorts of things that we could do with data. Then in, um, in about 2010, 2011, I was given the open data portfolio. So I started to then think rather than it being for internal performance monitoring and you know, red, amber, green and stuff, then what, you know, what sorts of opportunities were there around open data? So this was fairly new in the, the kind of the whole open data thing. So nobody was really doing a huge amount with it. It was, it was all a bit, you know, let, let's see, see what happens. So, so I started to, started to do stuff with it and kind of quickly-ish sort of saw the challenges associated with open data and how difficult it is to do stuff with it, but also the fact that a big part of open data, which was something that wasn't necessarily um, being kind of replicated across the country, was that as local authorities, it's not just about us pushing data out, it was about us using open data. So how can we use open data to, to start to do so? so? So that was my kind of mission then, and I went on this kind of big thing about you know, both publishing data, but also creating case studies, examples of stuff where, you know, where, we, where we used open data. So this kind of this this notion of using open data to support that kind of scrutiny role is quite well intertwined within a local authority because, as a local authority, you know they, they are kind of fundamentally decision makers, um, and there's a sort of a political element to it because there are you know there there are kind of elected members who sort of you know ultimately make these decisions. So how do we use the data that we generate as a local authority and the stuff that we can get from from around that you know around, from other data sources? How do we bring that and kind of mesh it with that, that political side of things? So that was something that you know, was, was kind of always there. And how, so as a data person, the fact that I got into scrutiny committees, which are elected members, was a really sort of powerful kind of way of using data to do that sort of stuff. So from a linked data point of view, in 2013, we did, um, we did something called the Greater Manchester Data Synchronization Programme which does not trip off the tongue, but it's, uh, you know, it, it, was a, it was a useful exercise for us. What this essentially was, was it was me in Trafford and Salford and Manchester all getting together and trying to say, we're going we're gonna to try and approach the problem of, you know, kind of different ways of doing data. So how do we u unify how we release data? So we picked like six data sets, I think it was. Um, and, you know, there was, it was things like allotments and streetlights, you know, just real kind of, lightweight, easy data sets. 
that we would each produce from our own systems in the same way so that they could be combined into one Salford, Trafford and Manchester data set. Oh, God, that was hard. It was just for something so simple as, you know, as where our streetlights are, the difference in the way that it's captured and recorded and reported was just immense. So, but the, the exercise was of one of bringing these, bringing these three kind of neighboring authorities together. We each had a code fellow put in with us. So we got um, kind of a civic hacker, they were called. So these guys, they came in and I got Stephen Flower, who's now um, with Open Data Services, I think he is. So he helped us turn our like, streetlight data into link data. So we kind of modeled our streetlights in RDF so that we could then get them up. And so back in 2013, 2014, when, so I wrote my first Sparkle query then, which was just such a massive deal for me, and having never really kind of exposed myself to it. But this new world of, of linked data and how we, can, how we can query Manchester and Salford and Trafford's data sets. And what we ended up with, we did a bit of a hack day where we sort of said, here's the data. And it wasn't great data. But some guy came along and they, they, they kind of did some stuff around mapping the streetlights and working out how much each one cost and looking at kind of streetlight density, which was kind of interesting. Plus, we, got, we ended up with a nice, you know, nice map to, to, to look at, which was, which was good. But the exercise of working with local authorities and, and working out how we standardise that data was a really, really valuable one. So then in 2015, um, because we'd sort of rooted ourselves as being a local authority who kind of understood linked data and this kind of stuff, then we were, we were then approached to partner up with Swirl on OpenGov Intelligence. So OpenGov Intelligence is an EU project. It's uh, seven countries, I think, and each country has a pair. There's a technology uh, partner and a, and a sort of government partner that, that pilots stuff. So the technology partner makes things and the government partner kind of implements it. So, um, so what we're doing around here is with Trafford, we started to think about how, because in the Great Manchester area, we're the lead. So the Great Manchester area is 10 local authorities and each one has a lead on a different topic. Ours was work and, um, work and skills. So how does, how does Trafford take the lead on work, improving work and skills across the whole of the region? So we figured we could probably do some stuff in terms of getting data about work, worklessness, skills, education, all that kind of stuff, bring it all together to try and give a nice, well-informed view of the, the sort of data scape for the whole of Greater Manchester. So we started to think about how we might do this, and we went to the Department of Work and Pensions, started to get, get data off them about the local areas. So the people that sort of run the, run the job centres, what data do they have that we can get hold of, that we can turn into, we can model in a in a good way that then allows us to create some stuff off it. So this is going on now. So we're, we're, we're a year in, we've had a, a year into a three year program. We're gonna be looking at how we, can, how we can model kind of data into quite a kind of statistical multi-dimensional format so that it allows us to query it, but also allows us to visualize it in, in ways that allow decision makers to start to make decisions off the back of it. And then in, 2016, I spoke at the ODI Summit in November. So I came and I you know, kind of did a, like a 10 minute thing about some of the stuff that I've done with data. But that was not the interesting thing. The interesting thing was this, which was what kind of so Tim Berners-Lee obviously, um, on his panel, he said, you know, he kind of very clearly said that, you know, so Tim Berners-Lee kind of you know, invented the World Wide Web and this place, I think as well, um, amongst, you know, presumably many other things. But he said, you know, kind of show me, show me the provenance of the data. And it really kind of hit a nerve, you know, that, that there was something bubbling away there about when we make data available, when we, when we release it to the public, what do we actually do with it? When, when I'm making stuff off the back of data, how do I link that back to, you know, back to source documents? So, so this was sort of, there was, there was a little bit of a, you know, went off in my, in my head then. And then in, so that was November, and then in December I left Trafford. So I kind of you know, went and I set my own, my own company up and I started to work with Swirl. So not from Trafford's point of view, but from a, just a general, they do linked data. So you know, the, whole, the whole principle of kind of better use of data. But what they really kind of felt that they needed was someone that could make the connection between the technical side of data, you know, how it's, how it's kind of modeled and how you, know, how you work with it, but turn it into something that government policymakers and decision makers can understand. Because there was a, there's a big gap there between people that get kind of proper data and people that are making decisions. So how does, you know, can, you know, how can we bridge that gap a little bit? And because I'd been born in local government, so I kind of got the political side, I got the process that people go through to make decisions, but I also understand the data, so they got me into to kind of do that sort of stuff. 
So, kind of rounding back a little bit, um, because I'm not kind of sure what the audience is. So, when we talk about, so Tim Berners-Lee invented the, you know, the, the kind of the World Wide Web. So, he took the internet and, um, and made it so that it kind of made a bit more sense and you could find things a little bit easier. So, that's this whole notion of the Web of Documents. So, the Web of Documents is a, you know, for example, a government website where there are hyperlinks on there. So, these are, these are things that you can click on and it will take you to another document. So this is, you know, everybody knows this, right? So, you know, you kind of, you pull up a website and you go and you, you know, you want your how to rent guide. This is using the kind of the World Wide Web to link from one place to another. So this is the fundamental kind of principle behind linked data. And this is its value. And this is something that I never really understood. So 2013, when I was doing linked data with the synchronization program, and 2015 with the Open Gov Intelligence Project, it never flicked in my head that that was the value in this. I always thought it was about... Well, if we use the same, so, so I always thought it was about um, if we use the same codes for, for two different things, then we can link them. And that's what I kind of, that's in my head, that was always, and I was always like a bit of a, not a doubter, but I always thought, but I could do that anyway without, you know, going through the, the trauma of having to, having to kind of model this data in RDF. So this principle of the, the sort of the web of documents, when applied to data, that's what my next slide is, so... When applied to data, it's exactly the same thing. So we can take the, the ideas of the web of documents and have in URL, so a URL, which is like an address on the internet for a particular thing. This is um, open data communities. So open data communities is a linked data platform that is provided by Swirl. So you know, kind of full disclosure, I suspect that other linked data providers are available. Um, but this is, this is a thing that we do with Department of Communities and Local Government. So when I first started with Swirl, back in sort of January time, I started to think about this and how, how we could turn this into something, you know, how we could start to make things with it that people could understand, that people could then start to think about and make connections and go on and do themselves. So, um, so this is a, a, the link data platform. So we've got the kind of traditional web of documents URLs on here. So you, know, you can go to the help guide and that will take you to a document. But the beauty about this is that there's a, there's a, a kind of an RDF triple store underneath it that's powering a lot of the data. So we can go to something like this and say, so this is, this is data now. So we've gone from a document, although it looks like a document in that it's, it's uh, human readable, actually this is an individual observation. So when we're thinking about how we portray data on the internet and the kind of the traditional way of doing it, which is around um, downloading an Excel spreadsheet, this is a slightly, slightly different way of doing it. What we can see here is that this is a particular value for Hackney, so it's the average council tax for this area. So the average Bandy council tax for this area is £1,328.99. This is a URL. So what this is, this is an address on the internet for this data point. So this is where we start to think about what, what this doesn't just exist as a, as a kind of as a row and a column in a spreadsheet. It exists on the internet in its own right at this address. So this is important for when we start to think about some of the stuff that I'm going to come on to later on. Oh, that's the URL. So this is, that, this is kind of the URL for that observation. You cannot read this over the phone to somebody. You know, it's not the sort of thing that you can say, you know, go to bbc.co.uk or whatever. You know, you're not going to get this over the phone. But you can copy it and you can do some stuff with it. So this is where you know, we, we, we start to kind of see the value in it. So when I started with Swirl, um, I was kind of messing around with the open data communities, thinking about DCLG stuff, just trying to get used to the kinds of data sets that are on there. DCLG is a, is a, is a government department. It has responsibility for housing, um, homelessness, local government type stuff. Um, so kind of getting, getting an understanding of what kinds of data was on there was really useful. Because in February, they released a white paper. And that white paper was um, fixing the broken housing market. So this is all about housing. So DCLG who have open data communities, also wrote a white paper which is about how they, how they, how they kind of change the housing market for the better. So I kind of read it, um, as you do, and it sort of quickly became apparent that as a document, we could have done a bit more with it. So where we've got a statement which says, the laws of supply and demand mean the result is simple. Since 1998, the ratio of average house prices to average earnings has more than doubled. So on our triple saw on the on open data communities, we've got that data. But what they've done is they put a footnote which says DCLG live table 577. So they've, they've gone to the effort, we've gone to the effort of modeling all this data and putting it onto a triple store 
in a way that we could do stuff with it. But what they've done is, you know, they've, they've hyperlinked to this. So in the kind of the, the spirit of trying things out, you know, kind of dog food in, I started, I tried to find that data item myself. And this is what I had, this is the journey that I went on. Google, so Google DCLG live table 577. And I ended up on, so these are the options. So data.gov.uk was like three or four years out of date. Then um, some kind of parliament white paper type PDF stuff. And then these two items here, which both went to gov.uk. So I went to gov.uk, I went to one of those, and it said these statistics are no longer updated by DCLG. Follow this. So then I ended up here, which is on the ONS. So I got to the ONS site, and I then had to kind of follow this, this trail of going through, which is right, you know, for certain things it's fine, because this is, it's just wrapped up in a, in a kind of statistical bulletin. So by going through this kind of stuff, um, I then, you know, kind of went into the meat of it. Then it said, show the data sets. So I managed to download the Excel file, open the Excel file, went to the contents page, and then eventually I got to a spreadsheet view of that data. But this exists now because we put, we've gone to the effort of modeling it. This is on there with a URL. So let me look, too damn high. Too, you know, it, it really is. So that's nine clicks to get to that data. So I wrote this blog. So, and I started calling it a blog, and then I've had to change it because it kind of got a bit of traction. So I've changed it to an article now. Um, but really, it's still a blog. Um, so, because I sort of deconstructed it and started to try and think about how we might do this a little bit differently. Um, and so, what I did was, I just, I kind of wrote, did some kind of diagram, circled the bit that was relevant, and said, if instead of doing that footnote four, you know, we've got we've got the internet, you know, we've got the World Wide Web. So why don't we put a hyperlink on that? That hyperlink, which is you know, is hideous, but what it does is it takes us to this. So this is one click. You click on that, and it takes you straight into this data set. So this is a view of the data. We can go a lot further. I'm not putting the rest of the stuff in, but like where there's charts and maps and all kinds of things like this, they all exist on the internet. So we can quite easily just hyperlink all of this up. Now, when I spoke to DC, so we spoke to DCLG about this, and they, you know, they were really excited about it as a concept because it, it sort of it validates the effort that they put into modeling the data and create, you know, creating the data models around this. But it's, it's value, you know, it is, you know, how, I don't know how many people would kind of drop off from, from this at any given point, you know, I'm, I'm, a spe you know, I'm an expert in this, and it's still, you know, it was a bit kind of, ugh. so, you know, I imagine that there may, there may well be other people that, you know, that are kind of going to drop out as well. Um, other principles, so, so, so now this doesn't just lend itself to white papers, and that's the, and I keep thinking of things now, where now, now that I've kind of got this, everything I see, I think, Flipping it, we could do that with it. So full facts, full facts are an independent fact-checking charity. If you've seen them, they are brilliant. I don't know how they do what they do, but what they do is they take things like um, the manifesto. So they, sort of, they've just done the UKIP manifesto, and they've taken five facts from facts. I mean, they might be facts. I don't know, but they, you know, from the manifesto and fact-check them. So they then go and they go and get the data, or they'll take a policy document and they will fact-check it. But they do exactly the same thing where. They link, these links all go off to documents, or they go off to PDFs, or they go off to you know, kind of Excel spreadsheets, when in actual fact, they could do it as well. Because the data is open and publicly available, there's no reason why when they're checking a fact and they say, actually, you know, that's not right because it didn't double in that time, it tripled or whatever it is, and here's the data. And they could link straight into that as well. It means DCLG are having their data used, and it means that the, kind of the, the value of this sort of stuff is much more, kind of, much more deeply embedded. BBC. So BBC do, you know, it's, it's exactly the same thing. So this is all kind of variations on a theme now, where the BBC write a news article, and then, you know, they might talk, so in here, source DCLG. Now this links off to that page, you know, which is table 577. Again, you know, this could, there's no reason why this couldn't link back to the source data if people knew that it was there and that, you know, that, that they could do it. This is a, so data visualization. So this is something that I made, which is a 3D map of rough sleepers. So the count of rough sleepers. Again, this is a data set that's within um, open data communities. So it's trivial for us to say, when we do a pop-up or a table or a data visualization, where you, know, you kind of just write in HTML, essentially, you can hyperlink that. So because we can get the data out of it and we can get those, um, those URLs out, I can make it so that this, when, when I click on Brighton and Hove Albion, which had a surprisingly high thing for you know, someone from, that's from the north, I didn't really know this, but you know, there's a lot of rough sleepers in Brighton. But it, what it means is that we can click on this, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna go, can I do this? Yeah, so this is the real one. So if I, let's try this. 
So that's Brighton there. So if we click on that, and then we click on the hyperlink, and it takes us here. So this is that page. This is that 144. So the beauty of this is that me as a reader, not as a kind of producer of this, but me as someone who's going, is that really right? Brighton, what, what, you know, I need to know more about this. So then you can see that it is, you know, it's the kind of you know, branded up. So the, the website, you know, DCLG, you can see that it's Brighton and Hove. You can see the reference period is 2016. So we can start to have a look around this. So we can click on the charts and we can start to explore the data. So that becomes a springboard by which we can then go and find out more about this data set in a much easier way, you know, than, than you would be able to traditionally. So we can kind of mix up, you know, go and, go and see sort of different areas. We can unlock the times so that we can see um, multiple years worth of stuff. So the other stuff, and then this is still kind of rolling around in my head as to the sorts of things that we can do with this, academic papers. So this issue of kind of reproducibility within academic papers, you know, if we link back to the, the kind of the canonical source of that data in a way that means people can use it, you know, that's kind of add value, you know, to, to this kind of stuff. Ministerial briefing. So we had a question on Tuesday at the DCLG about whether this sort of principle could be applied when they give briefings to ministers or documents. You know, can this sort of stuff be baked into it? And it can, you know, it can genuinely go into anything. Blog. So I did a blog which has done this, you know, and it's, and it, you know, once you kind of got your head around the concepts, it's easy to do. Hansards, and you know, I know Parliament probably wouldn't like me for saying this, but you know, in theory, every time something's mentioned in, in Parliament, you know, as a kind of thing, you could code it up and say, you know, here's the, here's the source of that. Consultation documents are where local authorities are maybe consulting on closing libraries or you know, doing stuff. Then the evidence for that can be kind of baked hard, baked into the document so that the population are as well informed as they, you know, as they should be. Etc. And so, one of the things about this is that because it exists on on the internet, on the on the World Wide Web as a as a page, in theory, if you get your search engine optimization, so your SEO right, then you could Google it. So you could Google how many rough sleepers were there in Brighton, and that page could come up. So when we did the synchronization program, we had um, we had a thing which had all um, all postcodes with their their kind of council tax, the average council tax band. And for a while, when you put a postcode into Google, and if it was in one of the Salford, Trafford, or Manchester, then it would come up with that page as one of the on the first page of, of results, which is you know a really kind of it was all annoying, but it's powerful as a thing. You know, if you want to start to think about how um, how we give access to data to people to help them kind of you know um, critique you know policy making, um, but or, you know just make sure that the population are as informed as possible. If you can get your SEO right, you know, then then you can Google it. So, or things like I bought um, I bought Alexa, which I hate, but I bought I bought it and I put in um, I asked it what's the population of Trafford. So Trafford's got a population of about two hundred and thirty thousand people, and it said three thousand people. So I was like, what? you know, so I didn't know where it was getting that information from. If we could set it up right so that there is population data or there there there, there is data within. Um, whatever database it is, maybe we'd need to do a skill for, for to teach Alexa to, how to query the database. I kind of started to do this, but I lost all will to live because it was it was hard. But you know, there are people out there who are better at this sort of stuff than me. But the principle is, you know, could we have some kind of thing which is almost like Alexa for fact checking? You know, where a council you know meeting can have this thing and they say. Oh, you know, what's the what's the number of rough sleepers in our area, all that kind of stuff, and you know, it sort of reads it back. So you've got this kind of stuff, but I don't know. I'm kind of dreaming. Um, maybe, maybe I'm not. But you know, this 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 kind of whole idea of um, of having having data in a way that people can you know kind of readily access it just feels like a, a kind of a really really valuable thing. How do we get there? I don't know. We need to get more data published in this way. So it's hard, you know, it's hard to do this. There's a lot of effort goes into it, thinking about how, um, how, you, how your data should be structured. It's pretty easy to just put stuff in a spreadsheet and, you know, lump it on the internet for, for people to download. But thinking about how you model the data, it's a, it, is a, it is a journey, you know, kind of, I, I sort of thought the other day, open data is more, you know, open data is a process, not a, not a kind of a physical manifestation of all well, it is a physical manifestation, but it is a process as well. So this whole idea of getting data publishers to think about their data, think about it hard enough that they, you know, they come up with a good, well-structured data model for that data, um, then they'll do it. 
DCLG has started to do it, and I, as a, as a, as a kind of a local authority data publisher, when people, so people have used their data, so they did, um, they also did EPCs, so the Energy Performance Certificates, which was a kind of a huge, you know, data, data set with kind of millions and millions of records about the energy performance of houses. Now, people have used that to make other stuff, so they've made a, a really nice map of the um, kind of house price per square meter, because that data set can be put with land registry, to make this, you know, so it's the first time we've been able to do that. And in DCLG, they're, they're really proud that the data that they've made available in that way has been used to do stuff that is actually really, in, you know, you do get a, this kind of, a kind of a free son of excitement, you know, when, you, when people use your data, even if it's, you know, for, for kind of bad things, you know, it's still a little bit, you know, a bit kind of on the edge. So how do we get more people data, publishing data in this way, you know? I think, you know, it's leading by example. And it's this kind of starting to make stuff, starting to do stuff with the data that takes it away from being an abstract, you know, pretty abstract this. Get it into, you know, so that people can understand it. People can, can see this is, this is my, my position in this. This is how, how I can contribute to, you know, this. Because the more that comes in this way, the better things get. So, you know, by kind of making stuff else, and I swear when I say we, I mean the kind of the broader data community that are, that are you know, kind of trying to do this stuff, publishers and you know, kind of civic hacker types, all that thing. And then increased data literacy. You know, this, uh, the, you know, the minute, I suppose, you know, there's a danger of you kind of ending up knee deep in, um, in RDF and, you know, kind of data. There's got to be something around, um, around how we sort of teach the population to be more, um, more kind of literate about data, how we get them to be more, more in a kind of a mindset which is around do you know sort of critically um, deconstructing documents when they get them or news articles or blogs? You know, there's a kind of a, a nice thing which is around April Fool's Day is the only day when people kind of critically look at the press and think, is this story true or not? You know, because the, you know the kind of April Fool's type stuff. How do we get people doing that every day so that they think, um, you know, is this true? Is this based on facts? How do I get into the facts that that underpin this thing? And if you know, we can kind of combine the publishing from a publishing point of view. And the people that are producing content, that are producing documents, how do we do that kind of stuff? I'm not kind of super technical, so there are some people who will be at this. This is this is my plug at the end of the session. Um, we can talk more about this. We've got um, we've got a kind of a swirl conference. The power of uh, unlocking the power of government data. 15th of June 2017 at the Museum of London. People will be there to talk about this. Um, who kind of know more about the technical side of things. Jenny's going to be there. Jenny's going to be speaking from here. Laura is going to be there. She's going to be speaking. So we're kind of very excited. So if you want to come along to this, you know, there is an Eventbrite page, and these, these are the other speakers. So it's, um, you know, it would be great to you know, see you there. I think that's it. If there's any questions, or I don't know how you want to do it. Oh. <laughs> OK, great. Thanks, Jamie. Um, question at the back here. Stimulating, as always, Jamie. Um, one way in which you've particularly stimulated my thinking is that presumably when you link from a fact out to a site, you're just using a standard HTML anchor tag. And I'm wondering if there is, or given that we're in the ODI and looks after standards, there ought to be some kind of markup to say, this is a fact link and associated attributes which um, can describe that in a way so if you know you're clicking on something you're not necessarily going to another site but you're going to something which tells you this is the provenance of a piece of data yeah. and it could be styled accordingly yeah I think I mean from a technical point of view that's over my head <laughs> you no know, I think from it it would it would make a lot of sense to do that kind of stuff you know if we can if we can tag it up so we can tell people what they you know what they're going to be faced with then yeah, absolutely. You know, can we jointly pursue that with the IDA ODI sometime? Because I think that's badly needed, particularly as you say, Tim Berners-Lee said at the last conference. What I remember him saying is you need to be able to right-click on everything to yeah, get a description. Yeah. And that's exactly what you're saying. And I'm not aware of a standard which explicitly says, look, this is where I got my facts from, rather than this is just any old link. Yeah. Thank yeah, I'd be, I, I would be happy to pick that up if you know, ODI are as well. I promise the ODI to anything. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah. um, sorry, I was late. It's very interesting. It's okay. Um, <laughs> all of these links are on uh, government websites, and all of the government web websites are managed by GDS. 
is there any um, pressure on GDS to open the format up? Because right now you can only put Word and, uh, well, text documents and CSVs on the GDS websites. And lots of good work done visualizing, mapping stuff was lost when, s when departments migrated. So, well, this isn't on, G uh, this is government website, but it's not managed by GDS. Um, gov.uk yeah gov.uk will only permit certain sure formats. that's so so i think to do that kind of thing then we would need to need you know and this is kind of again um yeah, i, I can't so um, the, the microphone is just for the people online so in the room um, it will sound exactly the same as if you were talking normally so just be aware of that but sorry jamie carry on. sorry um yeah, so so there would need to be a decision made, um, at, you know, by GDS or by whoever, that you know, if this was a sort of thing that they would they want to pursue, then you know, they'd, they'd kind of need to take that separately. But you, you, it, you know, you're right that this kind of um, that that sort of linking technology is doesn't come inherently with GDS products. You know, it is a separate thing. Is that not? Um, I don't know who would do that. I'm not going to do that, you know, because, uh, but um, it would be, you know, it would be, it would be, <laughs> I mean, I can do, you know, <laughs> but it's kind of, a, it's almost like a little self-serving, you know, it needs to come through somebody like um, Nick, you know, or maybe or through ONS through to, to kind of do that sort of thing. Yeah, I was just going to respond to both of those things because okay. I think there's, <laughs> there's a couple of things. I'm not sure it's exactly what um, you were referring to, but there is something called claim review now in schema.org, which is um, full fact worked with Google and others to um, on that. And a lot of independent fact checking organizations now use that to mark claim up. Review. Yeah, claim review. Um, they use that tag to mark up their content so that it can be um, at least highlighted in search results, etc. So that's a fairly recent thing. It happened last autumn. And so it may be part of the puzzle that it would be worth looking at. Um, and in terms of gov.uk, it's true that a lot of data is published there, but and you're absolutely right in document format generally. So um, often even in PDF still. Um, but uh, the ONS have its own website, so we publish off gov.uk because we're non-ministerial, we have our, our own website, and um, most of uh, the statistical part of government run websites like Open Data Communities off gov.uk simply because because it's not ready um, to publish data in that way. There's a lot of work going on in government to put pressure on. And I actually, I don't think it's even necessarily um, the need for pressure. The desire is there to do that. It's simply a case of resources and prioritization. Um, and there are a number of places where the ONS and others are very engaged in those conversations. So I think that's very positive. And um, to ask my own question while I've got the <laughs> mic, um, I think that was a really, um, a really strong case for four-star data, um, not to go into the details of five star but do you see kind of there's a really clear case for four star and then a case for five star in really specific circumstances or do you think we should all be moving towards five star i think ultimately i think we should all be moving towards five star i think you know because the the benefit and it's is it's the sort of thing that um you don't really know what the benefits are until people start to kind of pop up and do stuff with it like that so it's the, the kind of the four you know is that that's the that feels like the big step to get to that point and then onto you know onto the kind of the fifth is almost like a it's like an add-on you know where where it's it kind of feels like um people will start to make that fifth star themselves through linking you know things almost maybe dynamically i think loads of questions there. That's <laughs> over here um, hello, thank you. That was really interesting. So I'm one of your the kind of consumers of your data, right? Okay. Or consumers of data like this. And I've used the DCRG, the community's website. But um, I suppose the so my question is, who updates it? Right? How does the data, the DCLG data, get on the community's website? Who's responsible okay. for doing that? So there's a team within DCLG um, right. who so they 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 have a specific role around around kind of modeling data, creating the data sets. They do other stuff as well, yeah. um, but they, 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 they are responsible for taking data sets. They model it themselves, so they create the, those kind of models, they create the vocabularies, all those sorts of things, and then they'll 
get them into, into the system. Because this is, I suppose, it's, so it's a different group of people who are making that Excel spreadsheet, for example, or who are gathering in the returns from local authorities yeah. to then publish it. Because I suppose, and this is now a point rather than a question, that I'm kind of in that wider stakeholder list of those people who'd like to, you know, one day be citing this, as it is, I'd, you know, mm, I don't know actually if I would cite the table or I'd cite the communities, because for me it's what is going to still be there in three years? Yeah, yeah. What am I going to be able to find in three years' time? And it's like, I feel like data331, and, you know, you brought up the data dot UK, gov, sorry, the data.gov uk example you know and of course that's a you know that's a bit of a warning that like oh that's not been mm. updated that didn't that's kind of petered out yeah, yeah, yeah. so i think yeah. but, but i mean it's a horrible chicken and egg because <laughs> it's got to keep people have if people use it then you're going to then there's a, a kind of an argument to keep it going um but i think you know when you say when you described it as the canonical source of the data, that's the shift, right? Is to get people yeah, yeah. to see that <coughs> as the canonical source of the data rather than the Excel table as the canonical yeah. source. Yeah, so I think a big, a big thing for us is how do we get that data? It's all well and good pushing it out so that the public can use it, but actually you know, we need to get internal use of that data, internal use and reuse. So how do we get their researchers, their economists, their analysts using open data communities? Because it does, smooth it makes it much smoother to use data and they know that you know because they can they can start to use open data communities mm. then it makes things easier and that gives it the the kind of the longevity really because it means that it starts to be being built into to their own processes not just of data publishing but also of how they use their own data couple of questions online though I'm just going to go through first and then we'll go back to people in the room. So um, Jamie, how do you see open data standards fitting with link data, with the link data agenda? Is structure and comparability the big win? Yeah, so it's, I think standards need to drive it and standards are the kind of the big outcome. You know, it, without, I suppose without standards then it's, you know, it really isn't kind of linked data I guess because um, it's those standards and the, the kind of the application of those standards across multiple organizations that will allow you to start to start to pull data sets from different places and, and kind of do some stuff with it. And we have um, another one which I think links to the point that was just being made. Is there a risk that reports could be undermined if linking to the data um, that then changes if it's updated after publication? So this is something that we, we are thinking about hard, about how we preserve a view of data. So where somebody, if somebody, if somebody references a data set within a report, and that data subsequently changes, do we need to preserve a copy of the data that was cited in the report from a few years ago? If data changes because it was found to be inter incorrect, there's this kind of whole thing about immutability. You know, we need, to, we need to make sure we retain that, but at the same time, we need to make sure that the data's right. So how do we, how do we tag things up in such a way that we know that this is, you know, do we version the data? And this is kind of, you know, it's a bit of an issue for us in how we, how we do this because you could in theory end up with billions and you know literal billions and billions of triples which are kind of recording different versions of the of the same data set so it's it's a difficult one that but again you know that's something that we're, we're sort of thinking about at the minute questions oh. should we go first okay we'll go here first uh yeah so i'm afraid it would be rather a sort of long question but coming coming back to the point of what this lecture is supposed to be about is how data scrutiny can improve decision making. I've heard a lot about all the various techniques. I like to think I'm fairly well informed. I have 30 years in public service. I've just been working as a governor at one of the major uh, hospital trusts here. Um, and yet and, and in all those cases, you get overloaded with data. I've, I've never heard of Swirl. I've never heard of four-star and five-star data. But in terms of how decisions are actually made better by this data and you know, the danger that you create another silo of data experts. And I'm familiar with a lot of these concepts. My wife does a lot of work on the DCLG databases and so on but you just create a silo that does not affect the actual decision makers, people who are very busy, look at their smartphone for five minutes, does not affect the millions of voters and users out there, again, who if something's gonna make a difference to them, has to come quickly on their smartphone. 
and looking at what's behind you to be a sort of devil's advocate, should we not say, a bit like in the 60s, you can never go wrong by using IBM, that the sort of Google uh, uh, ecosystem, for better or worse, that's out there, that tens of millions of people use, you've got to plug into things like that to make it relevant. Sorry for such a long question. No, that's fine. Okay, so yeah, it's, it's a good point. That, so this is about rigor of data and how, how well the data is modeled. So it, it's about thinking very hard about data and how you can structure it in such a way that it allows, if somebody wants to plug it into the Google ecosystem, you know, they, can, they can make Google charts off the back of it. Or they can have a team of, kind of a big team of UX designers all working away to build products that make it easier for those decision makers to ultimately reference that data. But this is all about that thinking about the data and how it can be represented in such a way that it allows people like that to e more easily create things. So that's, the, that's kind of the, the whole point of it. So where, we're, where, um, where we've got people who are um, kind of thinking about how they model this data, there should be another layer on top of it. There's nothing to do with us. But it could be, it could be the members of the public, or it could be a, it could be an independent charity of fact checkers, or it could be a team within, um, within an organisation who creates that, that kind of interface layer to support their, their own decision makers, and that's so that's what this kind of is really is is it's not that, um, it doesn't in and of itself, provide better. Support for decision makers. But it makes it much easier for the people that can provide support to decision makers to do it. Yeah? Okay. Cool. No worries. Hi. Um, a comment and a question. So, okay. question follows on from the previous one, but I'll delay that a moment. So, <laughs> when you have data sets um, using RDF triple stores and you access that via URI in order to make it human readable, you have to have some further mechanism to present that as a, mm -hmm. an HTML page, as you know. Yep. And I think Swell did a very good job in the examples you showed us, which I think were from Swell, yep. in doing that in an informative and attractive way. But I don't think there are any standards around all that HTML wrapper around a number, yeah, for yeah, example. Yeah. If you want to speed up the process of being able to discover the data points which support your argument, it would be very helpful to have standard, some standards around the metadata that goes in the HTML, gets returned when you click on a URI, yeah, yeah, you know, when you yeah. call a URI and dereference yeah. it. Um, and the question was, I guess, was, which goes back to the previous one, how do you evaluate the effectiveness of what you're doing? What's the evidence? It has actually improved evidence and not just uh, people don't carry on doing um, pol policy-based evidence. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, I mean, you know, for me, that has always been difficult, you know, how to, how to kind of evidence the value of what I've done. Like, I, you know, I can talk about it, I can stand up and say, amazing, you know, it's really good, it's really made a difference. But actually, how do we quantify it? You know, and I suppose it's a, by creating case studies and telling stories like this and trying to find the bits where people have been able to use this kind of the principles of this to help them make decisions or to help um, you know, I don't know, investigative journalism or this kind of stuff. And a lot of this stuff just happens and we, you know, there's potential for it just to get lost, you know, and that we, we could never make the connection between that's, you know, that's what came from it. We'd have to work pretty hard to, to kind of keep on top of all that sort of stuff. So, I think what we'd probably need to do from a, a value point of view is look internally. So where I kind of mentioned earlier on about the fact that one of the big benefits of this is the way that it, it enables data to be used better inside an organization rather than as a, as a kind of as a public facing thing. You can kind of track that because it's a much more sort of closed ecosystem. So I suppose you know, we, we don't do it necessarily, you know, but I think it's probably something that that if a you know if, if someone who's kind of gone down the route of doing a sort of triple store type thing, it would be on them to to evaluate it. And I guess you know kind of internal type stories you know of where people have found it to be beneficial would be the would kind of off the top of my head would be the best way to do that. Yeah. Thank you for waiting patiently. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come around to you. Um, 
you mentioned uh i think you, i can't remember your words but you mentioned investment or uh anyway basically i work i'm from a finance background okay. we still use excel okay um we no, find sure not, no, no sorry, okay <laughs> okay good um and the what i wanted to ask you is is there a common kind of language by which excel data can be processed in a way that you can present as data in the, in in open data yeah framework. so so in the, in the kind of linked data to way yes. i mean so yeah so so all of this data has gone on a journey where it's typically you know it will have started out in excel you know so kind of a couple, couple of years ago or whatever it will have been you know traditionally done in in excel so the way that it gets modeled is there are existing um existing kind of vocabularies and ex so that some things all are already defined so um so people sit down and kind of scratch their heads and whatever you know about what the, what's the best way to to order this kind of stuff. So some, some stuff you can just slot in. So I don't know whether the, the kind of the financial industry has those kind of standards, but I suspect it probably does. You know, there'll probably be some kind of, some stuff which says, which kind of clearly marks things up and says, you know, this is you know, a particular, I don't know, like a bank or whatever, and, you know, simplify what you do. But that's the, you know, the, the kind of stuff that will already exist. And if it doesn't, you create it. So once somebody creates a standard, you know, then you kind of publicize it and that then becomes the standard for, for, you know, for, for finance. So it, if it doesn't exist, you create it. I just had a quick, uh, quick question I thought, but then everybody started talking and a lot of other questions came to my mind. But this is kind of an amateur question to start. Um, you know, Wikipedia uses like a lot of semantic data. Yeah linking um, data from one page to another within Wikipedia. Yeah. But when you get to the root of uh, wherever, the, like say the population of a country, uh, it can be referenced all over from a single source within Wikipedia, but then when you get to that single source, it's a footnote at the bottom of the page going to something like you described earlier. Yeah. And I'm just wondering if you are aware of or if you what your thoughts are on, since that is a very commonly cited website, which I know it probably shouldn't be, but it just is. And what your thoughts are in terms of like, is, have you heard of anything is like where the Wikipedia, uh, Wikimedia Foundation is going to be trying to do more deep linking into these actual raw sources rather than sourcing white papers or PDFs or that yeah, kind of stuff? Yeah, yeah. So um, I know Wikipedia has DBpedia, which is um, a kind of linked data store, which, which kind of has many of its things tagged up. How that works, I don't know. I think you it's know. just raw manual entry. I think by volunteers, a lot of times they take the stuff and they, okay, it's in a PDF, we'll put it over here in this yeah. table format and then people can link to it, but yeah. it doesn't go back to the original thing. So I think there is an RDF version of, of Wikipedia, which is yeah, kind of called DPpedia. Like yeah, yeah, so, so you can, so it is modeled in the same way as this kind of stuff is. So in theory, I guess, you know, the kind of the whole point of linked data, you know, you could kind of bring it together and have, have DBpedia referencing um, open data communities, say for you know for each of its things, if it uses the same um, same kind of identifier um, for an area, say. So if you like kind of looking at area statistics, then mm. Wikipedia could pull that data and display it in a table. Live. In theory. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. my other my other comment really was more can about. Can I just comment on that? Yeah, go. There is a, Take an initiative. Oh, sorry. Just, sorry. sorry. There is an initiative which supersedes DBpedia called Wikidata which okay. claims to have over 26 million facts on it. It's an open database. It uses RDF, and it is becoming the factual basis on which Wikipedia will be used. Okay. Will be, you know, Wikipedia articles in the future will be based on Wikidata. I think my other comment was more about what this young lady over here was saying and, and this gentleman back here. You know, I heard her... I think if you're into the data thing, part of it is because you believe transparency is somehow related to, and openness is somehow related to maybe democracy and freedom. Um, we have an inherent distrust of organizations. What was it? Wired magazine this past month had something about data, or data is the new oil or mm -hmm. something. Um, and so we want that data to be relevant and, and, and open and transparent. And I think everyone probably in this room has an interest in it or works on that full time. But I really hear this gentleman back here, also having been involved in politics a good portion of my earlier life, there's just 
even bad data, there's so much of it, how do you know? And so while this stuff's great where somebody can drill away and come up with hacks and figure out that intersections with bad street lighting repairs cause more accidents or whatever, how does that get summarized quickly in a very busy day and age? And so I think there's a really interesting balance going on here where we have someone over here who's saying, hey, I need access to the raw, 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 raw data. I want to drill down even further. Also, you're talking about versioning. Are we going to get repo, get repo every single data set and completely overwhelm any ability to understand the data? And then people arguing over which version is actually the most, you know, we see that already like in, say, election data and things like that mm -hmm. when they have recounts. And then at the same time, decision makers and policy makers saying, look, just give me the facts and I'll introduce a bill or I'll vote this way or whatever. And I think that's a really interesting balance because we have this one set that's driving to complete transparency, not a secret left unearthed. And the other side saying, if you do that, I'm lost. Yeah, yeah. You know, I don't know. Yeah. I would also add to that, are we at a risk of alienating some people um, if they don't have the data skills to go and explore the data themselves? So again, that's, that comes back to the fact that, you know, this, this is all about getting the data right, getting it in a way that people can then, you know, put stuff on top of it. So the organizations that are kind of, you know, building, that are kind of commissioning this as a principle then have to do, go some extra way to to helping, you know, and if that's a case, you know, wrapping it into uh, kind of embedding it within documents, then it may be that that's, you know, that's enough. And then the extra layer is getting in and being injected straight into the, that data. I think we've got time. If there are any more, we've got time for one more question. Um, or if there are no more questions, <laughs> we can just finish it there. Um, so thank you very much for coming today to Lunchtime Lecture. And thank you thank very you. much thank to you. Jamie for delivering. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>